We're back once again with the IMDb Bottom 100 and today we're taking a look at an infamous film in the world of fantasy. This movie and indeed the director of this movie have both received questionable receptions over the last decade or two. A whole video could be dedicated to the director of this movie who is considered by some to be the worst director ever. This is made even better by the fact that he is somewhat delusional and believes that he is the greatest gift to have ever blessed the world of filmmaking. Whether he's actually trolling or playing a character, I'm not sure, but it does make for a good bit of entertainment. That's right, it's the king of the B-movies, B in this case standing for bad, you ball. That is the film business. It's like a dirty piece of sh and I never played that game. I made movies and focused on the movies. The infamous German director who's blessed us with classics such as... Well, Ubal has made headlines for things other than his movies, remember? He's the guy who literally boxed people who said that they didn't like his movies. And I tell you what, it's a good job he gave up on that venture, because uh, he'd still be fighting to this day, because there's a few people. There's a lot of confusion as to how he gets some of the actors he gets to appear in some of his movies. His casts aren't exactly unrecognisable. Today's movie features the likes of Jason Statham, Burt Reynolds, Ray Liotta and Ron Perlman. But even more confusing than that is how he can continue to churn out terrible movies, yet still gets his new projects greenlit. So today we're taking a look at 2007's In the Name of the King, receiving a 4% on Rotten Tomatoes, a 3.8 on IMDb and a 15 on Metacritic, with actual favourable reviews from viewers. This movie does have a bit of a cult following, there are those out there who enjoy it and wonder why this movie gets the hate that it does, and if you are one of those people, fantastic you get more out of this movie than most people do. However, most people see this as a disastrous tale that lends heavily from a lot of fantasy films, namely the Peter Jackson trilogy. Even the title is a similar length, but thank God the actual movie isn't. So strap in as we take a look at In the Name of the King, A Dungeon Siege Tale, which was actually recommended to me by a viewer, so shout out to you, Adam. Appreciate that, mate. And in the opening scene, we get the first whiff of plagiarism. Not too dissimilar from the sweeping shots of Gondor, we see a white stone city with a solitary tree. This is just the beginning, though, and, and to be honest, there's nothing wrong with a movie looking like another movie. Just because a movie looks a certain way doesn't mean no other movie can ever look at anything like that. So, you know, this is just the beginning. I'll, we'll say that this is just a, a, a you know, a, a nice nod to the Peter Jackson trilogy. Each time we meet like this, I feel weak, I feel drained. Perhaps that is what love does to a woman. <laughs> Based Ray Liotta. I tell you what, it's it's good to see Ray again. Bless him. And then the movie gets rolling and we meet our protagonist, Jason Statham, in what is possibly one of the smoothest transitions I've ever seen in the world of cinema. I'm going to play you a quick clip now and I want to see if you can identify the moment where it transitions from one scene to the other. See if you can spot it. It's invisible. So Jason is a farmer working in the Shire. I mean a field. And he's not the most conventional farmer. You know, they don't use scarecrows around here. Oh no no. Instead they use boomerangs. Now, I'm not one for limiting an actor to any one genre. I think, you know, they shouldn't be pigeonholed and they should be able to have a crack at anything. Having said that, seeing the likes of Statham and Perlman, who we're all used to seeing in, well, action movies predominantly, at least. I am. Seeing them in a fantasy setting, dressed the way they are, it's, it is just a little bit weird. It's going to take a little bit of uh, brain rewiring, but uh, just try and ignore it. I do also have a bit of a confession to make, and that is that one of my guilty pleasures in the world of cinema is Jason Statham movies. I don't know what it is, I just freaking love Jason Statham movies. Crank, Transporter, doesn't matter how bad they are, you name it, I've seen it and I've enjoyed it. But just don't tell anyone. The accents as well are a bit all over the place. Every single person in this movie, apart from Jason and one other person that we'll meet later on in the film, has an American accent. Now, American accents in a fantasy setting can sound a little bit odd, but it, it doesn't bother me at all. However, hearing Jason Statham's like modern British grit in this setting is nothing short of hilarious. Why Norrick? Helps drown out the taste of the food. If Jason isn't in the upcoming Lord of the Rings movie, with that exact accent, I will be very upset. A wizard is never late, nor is he early. He arrives precisely when he means to. I kind of understand the importance of casting when, <laughs> when looking at when looking at these guys. It doesn't matter how good of an actor you are, seeing certain actors in certain roles, I will concede it does 
change the vibe of the movie somewhat. You're overdoing it out there. As long as there's food in the ground, mm, we have enough. I think that if your movie looks like a porn parody of itself, that's not a great sign. Now you might have noticed that I've been calling Jason's character Jason, and that's because they haven't actually told us what his name is yet. Why do people call Father Farmer? Oh, he's called Farmer. Does he have a name? What did they call him before he was a farmer? They used to call him Boy. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that makes sense. He is a farmer, but his name is Boy. I, that makes sense. Well, I'd say I grew Boy, wouldn't you? Wait, what? He's, so, okay, so he's not called Boy. I, I'm a little bit lost now. What, what's his actual name? Nobody calls him Boy anymore. Yes. No, I know. Just tell me his goddamn name. Didn't his parents give him a name? They died before they could name him. <laughs> Wait, what? How fast did they both die? I don't usually like kind of decide on names before the babies, but I give up. We're just going to call him Jason. I feel like it might have been Ubol that did the music and mixing for this movie. I also feel like Ubol isn't very good at mixing or music. We're then introduced to the threat of the big bad. They fight with swords. This is ridiculous. It's as if you were talking about armed dogs. Hey, look, it's Shaggy. <laughs> Shaggy's in this. No, not that one. Yeah, that's the one. Mariola. No, not John Reese Davis. Not him too. <laughs> They've even stolen the cast of The Lord of the Rings. I will say, though, that the cinematography so far isn't too bad. The color grading is good. Yeah, the sets look good, the camera works all right. It's pretty good to look at. And you've got to remember, this is 2007. This is way before the era of, oh, we can just, uh, you know, make, make everything look good with flashy CG. CG was about, sure, but it wasn't used as a tool to cover things up back then. It, it's a good looking movie. Hopefully it stays that way. Our sales at the market. It was good. Of course, the men try to take advantage of me because I'm a woman. So I make them pay more because I'm a woman. <laughs> Based. And we then get our first glimpse at the bad guys and, well, again, they look like a porn parody of the orcs from the Peter Jackson trilogy. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever seen martial arts in a fantasy film before. But I love it. <laughs> Unironically, find that super fucking entertaining. It's just Jason Statham kicking people to death with swords. <laughs> After he's done kicking these orcs to death, he then goes to help his friend, and thank God he's got his trusty boomerang. Don't worry, I will save you. Gonna wait for it to come back. Can you have a sword? Oh, it's gonna work. I'll be right with you. I'll be right there. The next scene then begins a trend that we'll see continue throughout this movie, and this is things happening for the sake of convenience. So Jason is left at home while his wife and his son go off to the nearest village to uh, trade all of the uh, agriculture that he's cultivated. While they're there, there just so happens to be a wedding going on. And while this wedding is going on, they just so happen to be standing in a bell tower. And, you know, the tradition is that when the couple kiss, you ring the bell five times. It also happens that this bell tower was originally built for, you know, to signal war when the, the village is under attack. And conveniently, at this very moment, while they're stood in the bell tower, the village just happens to come under attack for the first time in a while, by the way, because one of the characters does mention that, you know, there's been peace for so long, people have forgotten what the bells of war sound like. It just so happens that orcs then invade the town. Jason then turns up, a big battle ensues, and boy, I have never seen so many rubber weapons in my entire life. I know it's a bit of a nitpick, but even when I was a kid, I, I remember being able to pick out when they were using floppy props, and it... it it, it does take you out of the experience just a little bit. But then, shout out to the funniest scene in the movie so far. So, there's a big battle going on, kids are being kidnapped, people are being cut down left and right, and then it just cuts to an orc running off with a sheep. <laughs> I don't know. 
<laughs> I don't know why I find it so funny, but it, it, it just caught me off guard. And look, you know, his kid dies and his wife is MIA. We don't know where she is. It's all very sad. But while he's burying his kid, the music just doesn't quite suit the atmosphere. It's just a little bit too dramatic. I feel like it should have invoked a more sombre tone while he was burying his kid, and then maybe it could have cut to a close-up of his face and like, the shock and bewilderment on his face would slowly morph into anger as he has the time to think about what's happened, and in the background the music would go, you know, it would morph from the sombre tone into, you know, a vengeful fanfare, but I don't know, it is what it is. But now he's lost his family, there's only one thing he needs. I need a fourth marker for Solana. A what? I need a fourth marker for Solana. I I'm still not quite getting it. A, a what? Fourth marker for Solana. Oh, of course, yeah. That. L yeah, let me just check if I've got any fourth marker for Solana left. Um, ah, looks like I'm all out. Sorry, dude. So, it turns out that Gimli's daughter has been dating the big bad guy, aka Ray Liotta, and I think I've watched Goodfellas too many times because whenever I see him, he just looks out of place. Ray is wearing, like, relatively normal clothes, he's got his normal hairstyle, he just looks like plain old Ray. And nothing says big, bad and scary, quite like secretly dating. Oh, I hope our parents don't find out. Question, if you were to zip line precariously across a ginormous crevasse in the Earth's surface that would lead to your inevitable death below, what noise would you make when you leapt across the precipice? Whatever it is, sure doesn't beat this. Get that in slow motion, please. <laughs> now, like I mentioned earlier, the movie, for the most part, actually looks pretty good. This 2007 green screen, though, not too sure about that. Then Jason does a spot of man fishing and the party are back together, yay! Could someone explain why we're here in the first place? Do we know why we're on this expedition? Has anyone explained this yet? No? Okay, cool. By the way, the man fishing scene went on for about five minutes longer than it needed to. It, it, it just, it just kept going. Well, that saved us a lot of time. <laughs> Not really, mate. I'm also disappointed to report that the guy who plays uh, Shaggy in the live action Scooby-Doo movies, he's not really doing it for me so far. I cannot wait any longer! I mean, I know his character's supposed to be spoiled and spineless, but even then, I, I just find this particular performance to be not very compelling. Tell me, do you always appear suddenly from nowhere? I don't. I appear so suddenly from somewhere. Right. Yeah, no, th thanks for the clearing that up for us. Then, Gimli goes to Isengard. May the gods save us. Okay, it's not Isengard, but come on. Orcs, big fiery hole in the ground. I mean, I feel like we've seen this before. Then, our dashing trio then get tangled up in a tree, and like something out of a Japanese soap commercial, these, these, these tree people appear. <laughs> It's all very camp. We're lost. Men. Not only useless, but helpless as well. What? Both? Goodness gracious. I've got to say that the, the pacing in this movie is unusual, to say the least. I mean, some movies feel like they drag on forever and ever. Some movies skip over things too quickly. This manages to pull off both of those at the same time. Sometimes you'll be sat there wondering why on earth a scene went on for as long as it did. For example, the man fishing scene. And then when it comes to what seems to be important pivotal parts in the plot, they just skip over it. Like the, the mutiny of the king's nephew. Seems to be quite important, just kind of happens. Do we maybe want to like explain this, talk this out a bit more? No? Okay, cool. And I don't know if this is down to the writing, the directing, what, I, it's probably a bit of everything really. And then in the next scene, another theme appears that we'll see continue throughout the movie. And this is characters just knowing things. This is usually Gimli's character. And in this case, he's found out that his daughter is dating the big bad guy, Ray Liotta. How did he find out? Don't know. When did he find out? No idea. He just knows. And through the conversation that they have, we find out that because she's been dating him, 
she's been like transferring her magical powers to him somehow and in doing so has shifted the balance of magic within the world now that's actually quite a cool idea the idea that there's, there's like a finite amount of magic within this world and depending on who wields that magic determines like the corruption within the world like i say pretty cool idea the execution and distribution of that idea though pretty shit oh she kissed the bloke and, and now the world's doomed it's still a bit lame. Well, there's no time for that because it's now time for the big climactic battle and we're cutting between the two opposing armies and both commanders are giving impassioned battle speeches. Well, one of them is. Shaggy's is a little bit generic. This act of treason shall be avenged. Yeah, it's not quite like Theoden's battle speech, but what can you do? I, I do also want to say that I, I do feel somewhat sorry for fantasy movies that had to follow up the Jackson trilogy. Nothing has topped them yet. I mean, sure, Harry Potter, Game of Thrones, they came close, but in my opinion, nothing has yet topped. When it comes to a fantasy experience, nothing has yet topped the Peter Jackson trilogy. And that was more than 20 years ago. So I am tempted to give this a bit of a pass, a, you know, a, a little bit of leeway. But, but also, like, Peter Jackson's trilogy didn't stop this being a good movie the direction did. And hold up, we've just had the scene with the big battle speeches, but no battle. No one's fighting. It turns out that the armies aren't even near to each other. And we're, and we're now just walking. What? Never mind, because we then rejoin Jason's side of the story, and the two guys that he's been traveling with have been captured by the orcs, and conveniently, they've been placed in the same cage as Jason's wife, who we then find out is alive. We also then find out why it is that Jason is destined to vanquish all of the evil that plagues this world. Farmer will come. He will find you. How do you know? Because he must. Ah, yes. Of course. It would be silly if he mustn't. So it makes sense that he must. It makes complete sense. Then Jason's friends have the tough job of breaking it to his wife that their child is dead. It's a very sad scene, which is somewhat undermined by Ron's choice of words. At the end of the day, you're all he really needs. Ooh, not the best way of putting it. Like, it's okay that your child's dead because you're all that your husband needs, really. Fuck the kid. Am I right? Then, bombshell alert, it turns out that Jason Statham is Burt Reynolds' son. And by that I mean the farmer is the king's son. But Reynolds the king, and Jason Satham's the farmer. Are you telling me that that arrogant bastard is my son? It would appear so. It would appear so. So it turns out that Gimli hid the king's son as a child to protect him from people who would seek to kill him as he's the only heir to the throne. And then the king isn't really bothered or at all phased when he finds out that he's had a son for like 30 plus years. He never knew about it. Gimli was the only one who knew about it. What and he hid him all this time to stop him from being ki like I I'm confused. What is the point in doing that? Sometimes the gods know what is best for us. What the hell does that mean? Yeah, I'm with Bert on this one. The big battle then finally commences about half an hour and three story arcs after the pre-battle speeches. And the music once again seeks to undermine the uh the impact of the scene. This is supposed to be the climactic apex of the movie, and the music is just, well, this. You've got one dude playing one note on one violin. <laughs> It's just a little sad, really. It's not often that scores let movies down, but this soundtrack and the way it's been incorporated into the movie is not fantastic. But I will say, the battle scene looks pretty good. I, I, I do miss the days where you'd see 100 plus extras in one shot at one time. These days, people, like I say, you lean on CG, you can just duplicate people. What's the point in hiring, you know, 100 plus extras? But I miss those days, man. They were good times. And I do want to give props where it's due. There is a decent bit of editing in this scene. Watch this next scene. And as certain trees come past, they're actually splicing together two shots. And they just duplicate, like they're just reusing all of the extras they've used in the scene. 
And this actually makes the battle seem like it goes on for longer and that there's much more people in the scene. That's actually a decent bit of filmmaking that most people wouldn't pick up on. Fair dues. But then a bunch of random ninjas turn up? <laughs> absolutely no idea who these people are, whose side they're on, or where they came from, but cute flips, I guess. And then, I think I've actually found a scene that inspired the combat in Rings of Power. This is by far the dumbest scene in the entire movie. It looks like a Lord of the Rings porn parody meets Home Alone. That is some of the funniest and stupidest wire work I've <laughs> ever seen. <laughs> and the great news is, and you're gonna love this, it turns out the big battle scene isn't the end. There's still more film. Yay! Oh, if I didn't live on the bottom floor, I'd jump out of a window. We're then back with Jason's side of the story and Ron Perlman has unfortunately died and we get one of the less heartfelt speeches in cinema. What you always wanted, a courageous death. Oh, you're a brave old guy. And then to add to this tragedy, the big bad has captured Jason's wife. I won't kill you. I enjoy you. If you can bleed, you can die. Is that, is that a Predator reference? Was, was that, was that a reference or was that plagiarized? I, mm -hmm. Well, it's now time for the actual, actual final battle. And, you know, it's a bit more rainy this time, a bit more dark, and looks a little more Helm's Deep this time. And for real, it really does look like Ray Liotta just turned up on set and they were like, yeah, yeah, just just, just go. It's like, any makeup or costume? No, 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 just, just, just go. Just do your thing, Ray. Hmm. He's here. So then Jason and Ray have a sword fight, and these movie references slash... Plagiarisms are getting a, a little bit out of hand. I genuinely don't know if it's an in-joke or if he's just yoinking ideas from other popular films. I will have my vengeance. You have got to be kidding me. Gladiator 2! Is it? This, is, this, this has to be intentional, right? This has to be. Anyway, then Jason actually manages to kill the big bad in what is a pretty anime-style scene. And then they all live happily ever after. Now, if you're wondering what happens to Jason and the kingdom after this event, we don't actually know. That's just, that's where the movie ends. You'll just have to watch In the Name of the King 2, which, yes, is a real movie. But just before we go, you ball has left us one more nugget of goodness. Now, I might be wrong about this. Do correct me in the comments if I am. But at the end of the movie, when the credits start, should it not say a U-Bowl film, not an U-Bowl film, <laughs> right? Like I've mentioned, the majority of this movie looked really great. You know, a lot of the sets looked great. In camera, looked fine. The color grading was great. Camera work was good. It looked pretty good. But there were a lot of things that went unexplained. Lots of things happened for convenience. People just happened to know things. People just happened to be in places. Yeah, it's, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Sometimes it was so bad that it was entertaining and sometimes it was, unironically, just good. The majority of the movie though was just kind of, eh, just, it's kind of boring. I feel like it had a lot of potential. All the pieces were there, but they just didn't fit together quite right. I will say that to some degree, it did try to be its own thing. Saying it copied Lord of the Rings might be a little bit harsh, but it's not entirely unsubstantiated. It, there was clearly a lot of influence from the Lord of the Ring trilogy. Lots of, uh, lots of plot points, designs, themes, ideas. Even like the main through line of uh, the protagonist, Jason, is similar to that of Aragorn's, you know, a, a man of humble beginnings fighting against all odds and great evil to eventually become king. Only one was through, you know, for love, the other for revenge. I will say that although it lent heavily from particularly things like The Lord of the Rings, I will say it did try to be its own thing to some degree. It did try, it was a genuine effort to be like a good fantasy movie wasn't the worst movie I've ever seen, but I certainly couldn't recommend it to anyone. Thank you for watching and join me next time as we take a look at another one of the worst movies ever made. But in the meantime, subscribe. 
you bitch. And if you're looking for props from your favorite video games and movies, check out Raven Forge, the top link in the description. They support me here on this channel, so I'd appreciate it if you went and check them out. Thank you very much. And as always, a big shout out to my top tier members, Pazamon, Flunky, Jax, Brennus, Jindra, Cuss, Texas Lawman, Infinite Dum Dum, ATS, David, and we're now welcoming Michael Spakowski to the top tier. I knight you, Sir Michael of Law. Welcome to the top tier, my friend. Tier two, Steve the Goat, Dr. Melsky, Saeed, MG Virgil, Kuno Saka, Mark Maiden, Sensei Fang, Michael Terpia, Hadzu, Yarn Witch, Mendicant Bias, Dagger D69, nice. Michael, Saint Nemo, Ken, and Kenneth Dogromach. And of course, a big thank you to all of the tier one members and patrons as well. And there we go, another day, another video. Will you join me for my next one? You bounce and do, you little bounce. But until then, take care of yourselves, and I'll see you all very soon.